Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great opportunity, great honor, and great joy for us to have Vice Admiral Sri Anup Singh with us this evening, this afternoon. I say uh, all this with the knowledge that contemporary South Asia is what we do, sir. Only when one thinks of South Asia, one thinks of this South Asian landmass, and one forgets that this landmass is not as insulated from the rest of the world as one thinks. And I say this with a particular grief because I come from Odisha, and as a little child, we were celebrating Bali Jatra, not knowing what it was about. <laughs> and Odisha had a relationship with Singapore at the time of the Pallava dynasty. It's all forgotten. Yes. Crossing the black waters, say, being sent off, was enough for one to lose one's caste. And now, as your excellent abstract reminds us, the sea is an opportunity as well as a challenge. It brings trade, it also brings terrorists. That's all the more reason why this talk will help alert us to how to pull together land and sea as part of the common problematic. The South Asia Institute um, works with the support of two ministries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Trade and Industry. We are also part of the research community of the National University of Singapore. So what we do here is to look at policy in terms of high theory and force high theory to stand up to the challenge of being relevant to the world out there by the way of policy. And this we do through an entanglement of what we call our three Ds, democracy, diplomacy, and development. As you can see, it's a big challenge, and the research community, it's present here, looks forward to this talk with great interest in order to see what we can offer to your field of work and what we can harvest from your field for our own research purposes. With these few words, I'll hand it over to my friend, Shinder, who will take us through the rest of the proceedings. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Prof Mitra. Um, I also like to share uh, Prof Mitra's uh, opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Vice Admiral Anup, for taking time out to talk to us today. I think the, the topic, uh, maritime challenges in Indo-Pacific, in fact, just about, I think, less than two weeks ago, we had uh, David Brewster from ANU, yes. who came here to speak to us about the Bay of Bengal. And uh, just ISIS actually has been involved in, of course, on the academic side of uh, the topic related to the Indo-Pacific, but also a lot of track to uh, initiatives. For example, I think it was last year, uh, Observer Research Foundation, together with the Ministry of External Affairs India, organized the first uh, Indian Ocean Dialogue. That's right. Uh, and uh, ISS was uh, part of the, the yes. process and I think sometime next month there's another meeting in Delhi uh, on uh, the By yes and all and so we, we're also part of a lot of the processes and I and I think if you go around nowadays the Indian the Indo-Pacific the, the Indian Ocean has become something that everybody talks about uh, some people don't know as much as they should before they speak uh, but nonetheless it's a lot uh, a lot of interest in fact few years ago talking about Indo-Pacific ISIS uh, organized a seminar in Jakarta I think uh, Amit Hindu was there so. and uh, of course the Indonesians are uh, <laughs> when you come to Indian Ocean the Indonesians are very important and very interesting to see the range of opinions uh, in Indonesia about what kind of role Indonesia should play what kind of role India should play and over time, you get the sense that people outside ASEAN think there's always a there's an ASEAN stance on something. People outside ASEAN will always say, "What's the ASEAN stand on something?" You go to Jakarta, you realize there's not even one Indonesian stance. Forget about one ASEAN uh, stance. So anyway, uh, with those very quick remarks, I don't want to take up much time. So please, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sinder, and thank you very much, Professor Mitra, for those very kind words. Uh, for me, it is a special privilege to be back to ISIS. I spent a couple of hours in 2014 after the Shangri-La Dialogue and uh, met your predecessor along with Mr. Surinarayan. And uh, I think 
you have set the tone absolutely in the same wavelength as my presentation. Uh, that about uh, mankind being totally oblivious of the environment in which man resides and the environment which helps it go forward. Because all global economic engagement and national economies are supported only by the sea. But the problem is that man is primarily a continental creature. And that's been the downfall in so far as comprehension of the riches, untapped riches of the maritime domain are concerned, and the consciousness of the need for security in the 21st century. And why I say 21st century is, will become clear as I go through some of my slides. I'm sorry, uh, all intellectually rich people around round tables and workshops and seminars only speak with or without paper, I am a little intellectually challenged and therefore I like to go through picture postcards. <laughs> and um, I love these slides and therefore I also feel that you know subjects which, are, which people are not used to because we are so used to planet Earth of which we, we feel that everything is mainland, not realizing that only 29% of the total area is land territory, the rest is all oceans. So um, I am also happy that uh, I was asked to speak on the Indo-Pacific because not only is it a new geographic construct that has been talked about for the last five to six years, but it makes so much importance in so far as Indonesia, of which Sinder spoke just now, with uh, President Jokowi having started off his tenure by saying that Indonesia must be realized, not only become, but realized as the global maritime axis. That will also become important in one of the pictures that I made. Now, in the maritime domain, before I talk of the Indo-Pacific, there used to be only traditional threats, at least till about 20 years ago. No one had heard of non-traditional threats except piracy, armed robbery, poaching, illegal uh, resource poaching, and fish poaching. And what were these traditional threats? There were only two types of traditional threats. One was a threat of conquest by an outside power from the sea and by the sea. For example, this slide shows you the first recorded attempted conquest by a much larger force in the Salamis Bay, uh, an attack on uh, Salamis Bay, which is next to Athens, by forces which were much, much larger and had mustered some of the allies as well. But because their strategy failed, they did not succeed. And then onwards, people became hungry to, ac to acquire territory. And they came. the best way was to come by the medium of the seas. That's what gave birth to navies or maritime forces to protect your uh, territorial integrity. And the other threat, again, for as long as man has bartered and thereafter uh, exported and imported against cash is the threat to trade or commodities and products, which we call today as threat to sea lines of communications or slock security. It's become a very serious issue because all conventional warfare in the last two centuries was aimed by even a lesser half targeting commodities of uh, the opponent who was bigger or was more powerful, and vice versa, of course. And, 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 and apart from that, blockades were always attempted as the first sign of precautionary stage in war, with or without an announcement, to choke the opponent's harbors so that none of the essentials that were imported could come in, and none of the exports could uh, generate the revenue that, for sustenance of that country. So. The other thing since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution that has become a very, very valuable asset for as a lifeblood of uh, national economies and global economies is, is oil, oil and gas. And in the Indo-Pacific, uh, it will be important to note that almost a billion tons of oil, an oil equivalent that includes gas, moves within the Indo-Pacific even after the year of the recession 2007. 
and 75% of it moves into the Pacific through the Indonesian archipelagic states. That's a lot of oil, and that's a lot of oil because of the importance and criticality and sensitivity of the economies of all major emerging juggernauts like China, Japan. Japan is not emerging, but India is. But those which get affected because the Indo Indonesian archipelagic straits are Japan, Korea, and China. And they get, uh, they are the net importers, which are the most, uh, which are most critically connected to the oil lines of communication. In fact, I call them the energy lines of communication as the strategic lines of communications of these nations. Now, there are some non-traditional threats. And as I said in the beginning, the only non-traditional threats that were known to us in the maritime domain used to be piracy, armed robbery, uh, etc. And at best, illegal fishing. After UNCLOS came into being and exclusive economic zones were granted to maritime states up to an uh, extent of 200 nautical miles. But people were used to, to coming as close as three nautical miles to legally to three nautical miles to other nations' territory. Three nautical miles used to be the territorial sea. It was based in the 17th century on the principle of the cannon shot. And the longest range of the cannon was three nautical miles. So that was your territory, territorial waters, as they were called. But now it's 200 nautical miles. Now what are these non-traditional threats which have suddenly started coming up? First of all, uh, one has to introspect as to when did this change come about that things went worse than just piracy and armed robbery in the maritime domain. I think there are two watershed events that have reshaped the life of mankind in the last century. First, last, and the beginning of this century. First was the fall of the Berlin Wall, when Francis Fukuyama said it is the end of history, and we all agreed. I think it was the beginning of a terrible history thereafter. And the second was the tragedy that we are all hoping that you'd never find repeat itself in this form or any other form, whether on land or at sea. These have completely changed our lives. But they've also dictated that things will never be normal hereafter. And that's when uh, the economists labeled it as the day the world changed. It really has. It has because of the costs involved and because of the nature of life at sea and from the sea over land. Now, before I talk of uh, the maritime security challenges, it, Im it is important to see the most important ocean out of the three main oceans on which goods are transacted. Economies move. The Pacific, as you know, is the largest. The Atlantic comes next at only 76.8 uh, nautical square nautical miles, million square nautical miles, as against 155 of the Pacific. But the smallest, and I call it the most important, as you will see why, is the Indian Ocean at only 68 million square kilo, uh, nautical miles. Uh, sorry, square kilometers. Now, why is it the most critical? Because anybody who has to go from the Pacific to the Atlantic or vice versa has no alternative but to go through the Indian Ocean, except those who find it convenient to go through the uh, Panama Canal and are actually located close by. Otherwise, there is no alternative. And despite being the smallest, it has the greatest of disadvantages as the hub of the Indo-Pacific, as the hub of transition of all goods by the medium of the seas. And why is that? If you see very carefully, I'm sorry, this picture looks like a watermark. This is the only ocean which has got a roof over its head, which is not a very good thing at sea in oceans. It is closed on the top. At the bottom, it has got access to the southern seas or the Antarctica. On the sides, there is no opening like the Pacific or the Atlantic. The only gateways or access and, ent and exit routes are through choke points, which are navigational constrictions, which are hazards for navigation and hazards for security against all kinds of challenges, particularly non-traditional. 
For example, piracy took root in the Gulf of Aden in the Babal, Babal Mandar around 2002, but it peaked in 2006 and 7, and finally declined in 2012. At what cost? At the cost of, as per Lloyd's, a nine-fold increase in insurance rates. At the cost of 18 prominent navies, including the US, Indian, all EU uh, navies through the EU NAV force, Chinese Navy, Japanese Navy, Pakistan Navy, you name the navies of the region and outside, they were all there. And they are still there, some of them. All that costs money to governments, not just because of the oil that is being used, but you are depreciating machinery and platforms and people. They're not fighting war. The purpose for which maritime forces at such a huge cost are made. More importantly, piracy took root and has always taken root in constricted areas, where shipping finds it very difficult to go through at normal pace, because speeds are always economical speeds, but you cannot keep pumping in higher speeds than the pirates, because the pirates have found a novel uh, uh, way these days, as against the Vikings and the Blackbeard fellows, that they have got skiffs which move at 40 to 45 knots, but have got limited endurance. So they found another novelty of hijacking, first of all, some motherships, large trawlers or coastal ships which had long enough endurance. And these skiffs, four or five of them were put on each of those motherships. And to support pirates, you have to be close to land. That is why I said piracy has always taken root off a mainland or an island, wherever there are navigational constrictions where shipping does not have any alternative but to remain close to a landmass because of the navigational constriction. And that became an opportunity for pirates to use that particular piece of land as a staging post, staging ground. And then they used to charge off. And for logistic support, they had to be close to land, despite those mother vessels. So two years ago, when piracy suddenly declined because of the actions of various navies, which lasted almost five years of uh, effort, uh, an IMO supported uh, website calculated the total cost over just two and a half years between 2008 and 10 against piracy, efforts against piracy to be $5 billion. Who paid for, the, for that cost? You and me, while buying wheat, rice, automobiles, and whatever you have, whatever you have, whatever you wanted to buy. Another billion dollars, $900 million were paid by governments in deployment of their navies for those two years, just two years out of the seven years that piracy has been rampant over there. Another billion dollars were paid by underwriters, insurers, etc. And private companies paid the maximum, which I said in the beginning, two and a half billion dollars out of a total of five. Why? They had to create strong rooms, citadels, firefighting, hose, additional hose systems. They had to hire private security guards at a huge cost. They had to request their host or flag state governments to position detachments from their Marine Corps, as the Enrica Lexi case showed you, of India, who uh, unfortunately killed two fishermen under mistaken identity in broad daylight. All this added to the cost. Therefore, all these non-traditional threats or challenges, they add to the cost of commodities. And they add to the cost of manufactured products in particular. And the main reason for all this is the constrictions or choke points in the Indian Ocean. And I'll show you those choke points now. These are the eight prominent choke points. Now, a lot of people say Cape of Good Hope is not a choke point because a ship can go 100 miles away from the Cape. But shippies, for ages, even in the day of sail when there was no oil being consumed, time is money. They always wanted to remain on the shortest route. Therefore, they go close to the Cape of Good Hope. Now, fortunately, in that country, there hasn't, hasn't been any incidents of piracy or armed robbery. But that also becomes a bit of a constriction, even though it is only one-sided. The Mozambique Channel, 
the strait of babal mandap where piracy has been in vogue for about 7 uh, 8 years the suez canal the strait of hormuz the most sensitive choke point in the indian ocean because of oil the only exit exit and access route for the persian gulf and then of course uh, is what i said in the beginning about indonesia the indonesian archipelagic straits international straits of malacca sunda and lombok straits the most critical connecting and the only way to connect the indian ocean with the pacific unless you want to go around australia and spend four times the money and time nobody can do it there is a strait called torres strait between indonesia and australia but that is not navigable when I mean, i've been through that on a sailing yacht in 1989 and i only know how treacherous it is even for smaller vessels live apart merchant ships now the importance because of the map with the red blood lines that i showed uh, since the industrial revolution has been to energy and two thirds of all energy in the world comes out of the persian gulf at least 40% of oil that goes anywhere in the world comes out of the persian gulf and there is only one exit route 18 million barrels a day traveled out of the persian gulf last year despite demand having declined in countries like china and japan 4 million barrels a day through the suez canal 3 and a half through the babal mandap 11.4 through the malacca sunda or lombok straits which finally lands up through the south china sea most of it 11 million out of 11.4 landed up through the south china sea meant for those three important countries and the littorals like taiwan uh, philippines at times it has been importing etc now this is why i said that president jokowi is rightly said actually that uh, he said indonesia must become it is the global maritime axis there is no alternative to people and imagine what indonesia faces actually it is in uh, at many on many occasions of criticality of maritime security and threat to nations in that area not realized that because of unclos it is obliged to open up archipelagic sea lanes as international straits it is now bound by the unclos which is thus ratified they are international waters now it's not easy you imagine through internal waters of india through a river or a or the backwaters of a harbor if a foreign warship were to be going would you feel comfortable but that's life so it's a country of 17508 islands is that right how do you do maritime security that's why i say that these are critical lines of communication for the entire world but fortunately unclos has dictated that archipelagic states must give way to international states wherever there is essential connectivity now that's the south china sea through the singapore straits and the south china sea all that came through the malacca sunda and lombok straits goes 90% of it goes through those so this is the energy route brought out in 2012 by a graph which was brought out by the energy information agency of united states it was very accurate and it has only grown further it shows 11 million barrels per day of oil passes through the south china sea now robert kaplan has just recently called it in one of his monographs as uh, the throat of the world i like to call it the venturi of the world if this is choked that will be the end of the story all pressure for economies north and south of south south china sea will be choked why taiwan china vietnam philippines malaysia indonesia and brunei other than indonesia all of them are claimants to disputes in the south china sea they rely on these sea lanes japan relies more than any one of them korea relies and more than any one of them other than china Five point three trillion dollars worth of goods 
went through these sea lions, through these sea lions in the year 2013. 1.3 out of that belonged to the United States. $350 billion worth of goods belong to India every year that go through these sea lanes. They are, they are really critical. And what is a threat? At the moment, you all know, um, the South China Sea has become the crucible of all evil. Fortunately, over the last couple of months, there has been calm. But we hope that calm prevails. That's the other graph produced by the EIA in 2011. Six trillion cubic feet of gas passes every year. It's only been growing since 2011 through that venture. Now, this is a, is a graph which shows you lines in, with color codes. And the legend is that thick yellow, bright thick yellow, indicates the largest number of journeys by merchant ships of the world through a particular area. Which is the thickest patch? The South China Sea. Out of 104,000 merchant ships above 3,000 gross tons in the world today, 55,000 make journeys through the South China Sea. And that's become the most critical part of the Indo-Pacific as a maritime con con construct today. Now, what are these non-traditional challenges other than piracy, which are supposed to be the least of concern to anybody in this day and age? What is more critical is incidents of maritime terrorism. The USS Cole was hurt, not just hit, but the entire nation, the United States, was hurt. And everybody else in the Indian Ocean was shaken, because it happened in Aden, in the Indian Ocean, within the Indo-Pacific. When one year before 9-11, a powerful frigate called USS Cole was hit by a fishing vessel on a suicide mission. 37 lives were lost. A few others were maimed. But the most important thing, thing was to tell warships and warship-owning countries that you are not invincible. Why? Because it was a devious method adopted by AQAP, and it has become now the norm. But was it the first time? One year after 9-11, MV Limburg, once again off Aden Harbor, that ship was berthed on a jetty in Aden Harbor, with security on the ships being normal warship security. It is after that incident that all navies woke up and started in increasing and enhancing security measures, including by physical security guards by large, in large numbers, with orders in the US Navy since that incident to shoot almost at sight. They have orders that if anybody closes less than one cable, which is 200 yards, while underway or while in harbor, if he does not alter his course away from the ship, then the guards on US naval warships have the authority to shoot. That's how Enrico Alexis' uh, um, two Marines claimed that this guy was coming towards him. Of course, the reality was something entirely different, because India, having missed all the industrial revolutions, has, hasn't produced fishing vessels that can go more than, at more than 8 to 10 knots. And nobody can imagine that the guy was moving this way and a fishing boat was trying to overtake him. So that's the MV Limburg. And very fortunately, this oil tanker carrying about 60,000 tons of oil was hit by a similar vessel one year after USS Cole um, in 2002, one year after 9-11, and managed to hit only two oil tanks. The fire blazed for about uh, three days, after which it was brought under control. For almost three to four days, special tugs and uh, firefighting vessels from Aden and elsewhere were trying to douse the fire. And very fortunately, the vessel survived. Otherwise, imagine the kind of man-made disaster because of the oil spill and a wreck of Aden Harbor 
could have caused to the rest of the maritime world. Now, where is this? This is in the Gulf of Aden, exactly at a choke point. It's so easy to do these things over there. The first incident of maritime terrorism took place in Alexandria Harbor, in fact, in Port Said, at the northern end of the Suez Canal in 1985. Some of you will recall the Achille Lauro. It was a famous cruise liner, which was uh, hijacked by six terrorists of the PLO, PLO's militant wing, uh, headed by his leader, Muhammad Abbas, in 1985 to force uh, Israel to release six of its terrorists, 11 of its terrorists who were jailed there. Uh, after the shot, one American tourist on board, the NATO forces said, all right, we'll provide you whatever you want. They had wanted safe passage by a jet aircraft um, uh, into, into Tunisia, and thereafter, they wanted those prisoners to be brought. Uh, to with a safe passage to Tunisia as well. That didn't happen because midway, the aircraft was countermanded by NATO aircraft, which took off from Naples, formatted upon it, and forced it to land in Italy, uh, in the near the NATO base. And um, but the world, the maritime world, was shaken at that time. That this thing was heard about hijacking of aircraft. It can happen to ships at sea. But we didn't learn a lesson. So there were incidents of the city of Poros between Philippines and Indonesia. There were many incidents in the 80s after the Achille Lauro. The Super Ferry 14 lost 100 passengers. All these Abu Sayyaf and uh, Jamai Islamia gang, which did all these actions, including the Lady of Mediatrix in Ozamis city of Philipp in Philippines in 2002, and of course, the heart of Indo-Pacific, the Mumbai attacks. They came from sea. They came through the medium of the sea. They came through a vehicle in the sea, hijacked a hijacked trawler. Why did it happen? It was not a merchant ship. It was a small trawler. And it was a trawler flying an Indian flag with an Indian registration with Indian crew when seen from outside. This is why it happened. This is a picture of today. On the scope, on generally close to the west coast of India. All those red dots are merchant ships. If there was any warship, it would have been green. If you're not impressed by that picture, look at this. Zoomed in to the west coast of India. In a radius of only 1,500 kilometers from the heart of India, the center of India, on both coasts at any time through these four important slocks, we calculate 40,000 contacts. All of them can't be merchant ships because I told you there are only 104,000 merchant ships in the world. And they have to be in the North Sea as well. Otherwise, those guys will feel jealous. Why has everything gone into the Indian Ocean? These 40,000 at any one time is because there are 200,000 registered fishing vessels in India. This entire area of the Indo-Pacific, from a little further away from the east coast of Africa, down to the South China Seas, the extremities of the Western Pacific, is full of fishing vessels. By the way, the South China Sea is the richest ground for fishing and seafood. And perhaps nature has um, uh, provided this kind of uh, grant only because all littorals require seafood as 25% of essential protein there. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and sometimes with tea, fish, prawns. Therefore, the number of fishing vessels, 10% of the world's catch is found in the South China Sea. But a huge catch is required by the large population of Indian coasts. And therefore, tuna is found in abundance. And there are 200,000 fishing vessels on peninsular India and in the island territories. 
Now, after 26-11, we forced the coastal states to register each and every fishing craft. That's how the figure of 200,000 has come. But the Coast Guard still says that traditional craft, which don't even have an outboard motor, you know those, the ones that came from Francis Drake's uh, era, they are still plying there with oars. Uh, if you add those, it will become about 300,000 as per the Coast Guard. Now, that's an unmanageable figure because even if 20% of those fishing vessels are out at sea at any time along the coasts of India, it's a humongous task to, f to sort of sift wheat from the chaff. It's not easy. And that's why those 40,000 contacts are there. How did we get those contacts? They don't paint on radar. Even st small steel hulls at times don't paint on radar. This is because after 9-11, the automatic identification system in the world by the IMO, which is a UN organization, has been made mandatory. And at the behest of countries like India, IMO finally enabled it to be caught by satellites also, apart from UHF and VHF. And now it has become mandatory. Earlier, it used to be voluntary. So every vessel which is above 20 meters length has to have an EIS. And less than 20 meters, it is not mandatory to have EIS, so there are many contacts which are not seen. Now, many measures have been put, into, put in place after 26-11 in India to catch people who are either not pinging on the EIS or are not found where they should be you know, as, a, as a maritime security measure. Poaching, I mentioned right at the beginning, is also a challenge. It's becoming very, very critical because in many countries in the region, um, fishing uh, within somebody's EZ by an outsider becomes a great challenge to national economy. So I mentioned about the Blackbeard and those pirates are behaving no less than these guys and that's where the cost of anti-piracy missions is really going up. And modern pirates um, have graduated from being armed robbers at sea who used to pick up only ropes, etc., from fishing vessels and other and fish from uh, trawlers, etc. They have grown to become ransom seekers and uh, to great success. Sabotage and arson, particularly in ports, has become a very serious issue. And that's why after 9-11, the ISPS code, uh, International Ship uh, Protection and uh, Control Code, uh, has been made it has not, still not been made mandatory because many countries say, sorry, that the costs are very high, which is a problem. Uh, most all, all major ports in India and all important private ports are ISPS um, complied, com uh, have ISPS compliance now. But imagine a port like Shanghai, which is the number one port in the world with 33 million TEUs, containers, and 710 million tons of cargo in one year. It superseded Singapore as the number one port in 2007, if there were to be a blast. Now imagine a disaster which took place in Tianjin port, which is also one of the top 10 in the world today in throughput, has completely paralyzed A, economy, not of the region, but of the nation, and B, that port. It was one of the top 10 in the world. Now, that is known to be not a man-made disaster. It is a man-made disaster in the sense of negligence. But it's, it had nothing to do with maritime terrorism. If that kind of a thing had happened because of maritime terrorism, I mean, imagine the costs that one would have to pay. Not just the thousands of automobiles which were burnt out and other warehouses and ships which have got damaged, but many other resources. And the port, of course, is out of action for some days. Drug running and gun running has become the order of the day for terrorists. So they found it very easy to make money through exchange of these two commodities, one which is required by them and one which is exported by them. And the worst part out of the crescent is the hash highway along the Makran coast. And that's where Task Force 150 was put in place by the US Navy it's not under UN umbrella, and that's why India refused to um, sort of join that coalition. But 
but they were they were catching during operation enduring freedom and iraqi freedom they were catching many people now there is also a new traditional threat well it's a challenge not a threat as yet but it is a challenge um because of its content there are now submarines and ships coming into the indian ocean from china and they are making forays not like adventurers like cheng ho etc or, or the as part of the uh, treasure fleet but in a manner in which many littorals in the indian ocean region are becoming uncomfortable so while sub a submarine a uh, nuclear powered sub attack submarine an ssn came into the indian ocean for the first time in the history of nuclear propulsion with a note verbal from the diplomatic establishment in china to six countries including india including united states including russia meaning those who operate submarines in the region to say that one of our nuclear attack submarines will be on an excursion into the indian ocean over the next couple of months now what kind of picnics are done even in conventional submarines goes beyond our minds it's obviously getting into somebody else's turf to collect intelligence which is not a very good thing because then the same business of the cold war era of marking counter marking shadowing and overshadowing will start so it's a challenge it's a challenge because the indian ocean possesses littorals which are have nots not just relative have nots but have nots and they are some of them are poor chaps are easy clients there was another incident which is not very serious but all the same because of the criticality of the indonesian archipelagic straits has become a little serious the chang bai shan is one of the latest expeditionary warfare platforms of china it's it can take about 900 troops about 6 or 7 helicopters and a large number of hovercraft etc for this is the modern form of amphibious op operations platform that at a stand off range from shore out of harm's way it can land troops in the case of acquisition or in defending somebody so the chang bai shan along with two contemporary destroyers came down through the sunda strait in early 2014 went very close to christmas island this is in january of 2014 one month after christmas and christmas island belongs to australia almost kissed christmas island and went back through the lombok strait so i have started calling this kind of an activity eve teasing because it doesn't make any sense to man or beast a you are maneuvering inside the internal waters of indonesia but indonesia cannot complain because there are international straits and there is a weakness in the law of the sea which everybody including china has ratified where the eez or the high seas or straits are open to military vessels to warships of other countries and the weakness is that in the ez this law is silent on another navy's vessels even carrying out live fire drills so while live firing was not done because that would have been harakiri of a kind but they carried out maneuvers including by their helicopters which is not done in international straits so whom were the teasing is uh, and in what form and why is not understood but it is not a very comfortable scenario these were the ships which came through then in september of 2014 a submarine docked in the brand new china the colombo international container terminal along with a support vessel the tender this was a conventional submarine and it docked again in the same port which has been built by china in colombo two months later in november so when freelance authors contributors analysts in india made noise about as to why and why did sri lanka allow this and why is china doing this kind of a thing forays into the indian ocean with 
submarines, etc. The Sri Lankans at that time, as well as the Chinese said, what is wrong? This submarine, there were not two submarines, there was only one submarine. It went to the Gulf of Aden in support of anti-piracy mission. Since when have we started sending aircraft underwater? It's, it's doing something like that. You know, you can't be using a valuable asset like a conventional submarine for anti-piracy mission. It does not have any binoculars. It's got a periscope which is no good for anti-piracy mission. And you're burning up platform hours, engine hours, and crew fatigue. So they made an excuse which we knew they, may, they will, that the Dutch had also done it as part of EU NAV4 in the year 2008 and 10. Well, they were part of NATO forces doing exercises, and we know they informed the entire world that they are going into that area, while EU NAV4 was present in the Gulf of Aden for anti-piracy mission. So all this activity, everybody knows submarines are sent, A, for clandestine missions, B, before clandestine missions, in peace time to collect intelligence and to familiarize yourself with the temperature, salinity, and humidity of the area because these things change the sound velocity profile underwater. So that you know what kind of detections, what kind of traffic is seen. Then this is also the dawn of the sulfide era because in the old days, you will recall India was the first of the seven pioneer states which was allotted an area of 150,000 square kilometers in the central Indian Ocean basin about 1,000 miles south of Cape Comorin to explore polymetallic nodules, which India succeeded in, um, uh, in the pilot project, but thereafter it found it very difficult to uh, start exploiting because A, technology was being denied, B, uh, it became a very expensive proposition to do it without anybody else who wanted to take away the nodules, like you do in oil exploration. So now the world has moved towards sulfites. And the UNCLOS laid down that you don't have to remain close to your land. You could, India, for example, could ask in the high seas, if there were high seas, inside the Arctic. Anything beyond a country's exclusive economic zone is the high seas, and that has been called since 1982 as a common heritage of mankind, which is open to all, including landlocked states like Nepal, Bhutan, etc., who do not have opportunities otherwise, including for fishing. So China made an application in 2009, and in 11 was allotted by the Inter International Seabed Authority an area of 10,000 square kilometers in the Indian Ocean in the southwest Indian Ocean ridge of Madagascar. And now it has started sending its vessels for exploitation. Exploration is already successful. And I think, uh, I think the switch is. I was worried because this kind of a thing I face only in India where lights go off. <laughs> but not in auditoriums. You've got backup everywhere. So they are there. Surveillance vessels are coming and going. And now warships will start coming for protection of assets. So it's all right. It is legitimate if India were to have a similar area in the Pacific. Uh, we would do something similar. But this is a point being made that, that that is one more reason for its warships to come in. And it adds to the crowd which is coming in for excursions. As if all these challenges, non-traditional and neo-traditional ones were not enough, the Indo-Pacific that we are talking of today gets slammed by 80% of all the natural disasters of the world. The Indo-Pacific from the east coast of Africa, to the eastern extremity of the Western Pacific. The Indian Ocean gets 70% of them, 70% of all the world's natural disasters. So tsunamis, typhoons, tropical revolving storms, deep depressions are the order of the day. Apart from avalanches, earthquakes, I'm talking of everything on land and otherwise. 
all this now gets catered for best by maritime forces because moving over the sea means you can carry volumes and large numbers of passengers at a time. So na maritime forces are used also for humanitarian intervention against natural disasters and man-made disasters. For example, a task force went to the Mediterranean and by coincidence there was a man-made disaster of an attack by Israel on Hezbollah and Hezbollah's hub was Lebanon in 2006 and that's how you do humanitarian uh, intervention in the sense humanitarian assistance and, in, and disaster relief, HADR. I feel that all this is happening ever since the dawn of globalization. We were all told in 1991, it's the dawn of a new world order and things are going to be hunky-dory hereafter. The globe is becoming a village and therefore there are no barriers and therefore it is open to all including ISIS to go from one place to the other. Fortunately, till now, that, mean, that means till this moment, ISIS is a group of land lovers. But it's not going to be too distant a dream for them to start moving to the sea. As Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, without training as fishermen, went and rammed into MV Limburg and before that into USS Cole. And please don't forget what was attempted by a couple of terrorists inside a protected base in Karachi in the naval base when they tried to hijack PNS Zulfikar, a frigate of the day. And it is also actually full marks to the guys on board, luckily it happened during daytime, that they were able to uh, ward off these fellows and arrest one of them. So we are in for not too great uh, an era and all this costs money in the maritime domain. So as I said, it's been the era of globalization which has created all these non-traditional challenges because I always look at this caricature of 1952 and I feel that this in best encapsulates with um, the good times in the Cold War when people thought terrible times are on because of nuclear overhang and it shows Truman and Stalin at two ends of the scale despite this vast disparity in the number of warheads with the Soviet Union and the United States in 51 and 52, there was balance of power and the best equation was maintained perhaps because of the paradigm of MAD, mutual, mutual assured destruction. There were no terrorists, certainly not at sea. There were no incidents of piracy reported except when it started in the Malacca Strait, again because of a navigational constriction. There were no problems to see lines of communication. The only problems used to be between the Warsaw Pact and NATO in so far as incidents at sea were concerned. So what is the remedy? Is world's maritime forces, navies in particular, the only panacea for killing all these ills? It can't be. First of all, individual nations' maritime forces cannot be sufficient, cannot be found sufficient to deal with all the ills. Because these guys do not have home bases, they shift from place to place. Cooperation is the answer. And in maritime domain, cooperation starts with navies of a region. And it is not, ascent, it is not sufficient to limit it to a particular region. It must go across regions like in areas like the Indo-Pacific. What should happen? The Indian Ocean Naval Symposium is a sister and a clone of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. We copied it from them. So why can't there be linkage between the two? Why can't there be linkage between CSCAP, APEC, IORA, name the multilateral, uh, multinational political forum and name the multinational maritime forum. Let there be vertical and horizontal linkages in order to create synergies and interoperabilities. 50% of the problems in the maritime domain can be solved insofar as non-traditional and new traditional challenges are concerned. 
and that's because cooperation makes beautiful music thank you